So what is this name map thing in Test Complete? Well, everything depends on object identification. You need Test Complete to identify objects in your application if you're going to interact with them. So you want three things. A list of the objects you want to interact with, a unique name to identify those objects, and a way to uniquely identify each object. And that's all the name map is in Test Complete. It's a list of objects, web pages, buttons, forms that you need your automation scripts to interact with. So why do we need it? Let's set some context then and see why this is important. Now imagine you have your application, perhaps that's a calculator app in this example, and you've got a text box which displays any calculation results and you've got a number of buttons that you might want to interact with. And you write your keyword tests or your scripted tests to interact with that application. And each time you interact with an object, say the button number one, you need to reference that object with a name and you need to have some properties to identify that object. So perhaps it's a button and it has the number one on it. Now you reference that button on many occasions throughout your script and that works well until you get the next release of your application. And stick with me on this example, but imagine that button changes in the next release of your application. And no longer does it have the number one written on it, it has one written in letters. And in all instances of your scripts so far, where you've referenced that button, you've used the property one to identify that button. And that object has now changed, which has now broken all of your references in your scripts, which interact with that button. So where the name map fits in is that it provides a layer of abstraction. So it sits between your scripts and the application. And for each object you want to interact with, perhaps that number one button, you have one entry in the name map that references. And that name map entry has three things, as I said. One is a list of all the objects you want to interact with. Two is these unique names that you're going to use in your scripts to reference the object. And three is a list of properties that are needed to identify that object. So in this instance, in our list, we've got our object to identify the number one button. And we have some properties for that object that identify it. So in this case, we might identify it by the number one on the button object. And then all of our scripts reference the name map rather than the object itself. And what this gives us, as I said, is that layer of abstraction so that if your object changes in a release, maybe they do put this text one on the button, you don't have to go through and update every line in your script. All you have to do is update one entry in your name map. And that layer of abstraction makes it far simpler for us to maintain and update all of the objects that we need to interact with in our application. So how does Test Complete do this then? Well, in every test you write, when you interact with an object, you will need a name that refers to the object you want to interact with. So if you've got a text box, you need the name of the text box that you want to interact with and set a text for. If you've got a button that you want to click, you need the name of the button that you want to click and you need to reference that name as the test item entry in your test cases. And that name that you use here refers to the name in the name map that you define. So in this instance, if I take this test and I write click on and click operation on a button 
and I go show object in the name mapping editor, it takes me to that object in the name mapping er editor. And the unique name we're using to reference that object is listed up here. But there is actually three naming conventions that Test Complete uses. And this will help clarify some of the concepts that are implemented within Test Complete. So we have three ways to reference an object. In the object browser in Test Complete, we have a list of all of the objects on your system that Test Complete can see and interact with. And the top level object for that is the sys object, which is your system and all of the properties and all of the methods associated with that system. So for example, you might have the username that you're logged onto your system with. In this case, that property username is set to bill for the system object. Now, if I want to refer to that system object, I can refer to it with its full name, which is sys in this instance. And if I drill down further for other objects that are child objects on my system, I can see that I have browser edge running on my system and that's then referred to as sys.browser and in brackets edge to uniquely identify as the edge browser. And we can drill down even further and we can look at pages and we can look at objects on those pages within that browser. But essentially at this level, this lowest level, we can identify objects with their full name using the object browser and refer to those objects with that full name, which always starts with sys dot something. So sys dot browser, sys dot notepad, sys dot test complete, whatever that object is. And at this level, with the object browser, we see every single object on your system that's running that Test Complete has visibility of. But what we want to do as we write our automated tests is we only want to focus on one or two of those objects. So the next level up I think of as Test Complete's view of the world or the objects that you want to interact with in your application. So we filter out a lot of the stuff we don't need and we focus on just the applications and objects that we want to have our automated tests interact with. And this is represented by this panel here. And I like to think of this as Test Complete's view of the world. This panel here is the list of objects we told Test Complete we're interested in interacting with and test complete list them in this panel. But what we're actually interested in is this aliases panel. So this is the third level up and this is a filter of the objects we want to interact with and it allows us to tweak and adjust maybe the naming convention so you can rename the objects here and you can change the hierarchy if you want if you want to remove objects that you're not interested in so maybe this form I'm not interested in I can drag that up and, and juggle things around but in in any case this is my view of what I want to interact with and I refer to these objects with the the aliases nomenclature right followed by the particular object I'm interested in. So we've got three ways to reference objects in our scripts. So the first way is the sys full name nomenclature and if we're using that naming convention it's kind of the equivalent of skipping or bypassing the name map. So if we go back to this diagram if we use sys if we use sys dot something that's referring to the object bypassing the name map and referring directly to the object. Then we've got the test complete naming convention. So if I was to show that object in the name mapping editor, you'll see in here that we've got that browser 
browser edge and we can refer to that using name mapping sys.browser. Okay, and then the third way is with the alias naming convention and that object can be referenced using a slightly shorter, more meaningful naming convention where we just use aliases.browser. And this is the full name, this is test complete's name, and I consider this to be the name that I want to refer to to objects within my test. But all of these will work. So that's the name and how we reference the object. The other key part to this is how we identify the object. And you'll notice that every object, when we view it in the object browser, has a number of properties. And what we need to do when we list objects in the name map is specify the properties that we want to use to identify that object. So if I want to identify a browser, my alias browser object that's listed in my name map, I can pick the properties I use to identify that. And those are listed in this panel here. And we can modify those by clicking on the edit button if we want. And test complete allows us to pick from a list of properties on the right hand side and add those to the properties that we are going to use to identify the object. Now some of the properties in here are not good options for identifying objects. For example, this process ID, that would be a bad choice because that process ID might change every time we start our PC, our laptop, whatever. But other properties are good properties to use to identify objects. So for example, the process name might be a good, good option for identifying an object. So in this case, if we always want to identify the browser edge, then process name and MS Edge is probably going to be a safe bet for identifying that. But you can see that test complete has already picked an object type property and the name property browser.edge as good options for identifying my browser. And that's the fundamentals for the name map. You need the name of the object in the name map list and you need the properties that you're going to identify that object with defined in the properties list. Now that might all sound a bit excessive for those of you coming from a background like Selenium, where you've just had XPath or CSS selectors. Well, the game changer for Test Complete came in version 15. And whilst this name map approach worked for desktop applications and web applications, it is a little cumbersome for web applications. But in version 15, what we got was the ability to use XPath or CSS selectors as part of the list of properties that we use to identify an object. Now, obviously XPath CSS selectors can't be used to identify a browser or a calc application. So we do need the standard approach of using properties and property values to identify some objects that might not be on a web page, but now we can use lower down in that hierarchy for objects on a page, we can use these XPath or CSS locators. And you have a number of ways to do that. When we use the object spy on a web page, for example, and we drag the object spy over one of the objects, you'll see that test complete comes up with an identification method for that object that uses that naming convention we've already spoken about, followed by a find element and then the XPath or CSS select. And if we go back to our name map, we'll see that when we map these objects, test complete will come up with um, you know three or four, five or six different potential XPath or CSS selectors which we could use. And typically the biggest issue I find with test complete and the name mapping is that by default, if you go to tools, options, engines and name mapping, is that by default, it's set to map objects automatically. And what that tends to do is leave test complete free reign to add entries in here, create the hierarchy it likes, and you'll find, especially with complex web apps, 
that it tends to make a little bit of a mess of this, this structure in the name map. So I like to switch that off. And especially at the start of a project, I like to map objects manually myself. And I map it in a hierarchy. I'd map the browser object. And then I'd map all of the individual page objects. And then I'd come in and I'd, in, I'd map all of the individual objects on a page until I start to get a feel for the application and I know that I've got that base structure created nicely so I can see that I've got a browser, I've got a page and then I've got the find element using CSS or XPath selectors and I build things up that way initially so that I can keep track of and make sure that I end up with a neat name map that's easy to manage and easy to maintain. As I said at the start, object identification is the foundation of all of the tests you're going to be building for your application. Keep this neat, tidy, well organized, and it makes your life in writing your tests and maintaining those tests far easier in the long run.